Stanford University. Going around that you sign your name to if you're signed up for the course. I don't see Bree, but when Bree walks in, she'll, she'll have the sheet. And uh, next week, we'll have Joel Brandt from the Department of Computer Science. Joel will be defending his thesis work on how the web is changing programming practices and tools that he's built to help support the programming experience. Today, I'd like to welcome Jody Ferlisi, who is a professor of HCI and design at Carnegie Mellon University. Welcome. So thank you, everybody. It's great to be visiting Stanford. And today, I'm going to share some of my thinking from integrating design research with HCI and other disciplines and collaborating in interdisciplinary design for services, systems, and beyond. So maybe a lot of you don't know who I am, so I thought I should give you a background slide. I'm an interaction designer and design researcher, and my broad interest is how products evoke social behavior. I was actually trained as a fine artist. I have a degree in illustration from the University of Arts in Philadelphia. And after I finished my undergrad, and partly during the time I was there, I worked with people at University of Pennsylvania, scientists illustrating their concepts. So I illustrated a theoretical physics textbook, for example. And I think this was formative because I collaborate with scientists today. Um, I received my master's and PhD from Carnegie Mellon. I did a self-divine PhD in design and HCI. I've been a consultant working at eLab. I worked on broadly understanding people's behavior to inform the design of products. And this got me really interested in design methods. And at CMU, I actually hold a chair in computer science. And I'm not saying that to toot my own horn, but I'm saying that because I think it's really exciting that the School of Computer Science values design. So I'm interested in taking a research through design approach to understand how products evoke social behavior. And research through design, I'll talk about more throughout my talk, but this is an activity that designers do naturally. They look at the current state, they make prototypes and products, and they suggest what a future state might be. We look at problems holistically, and we draw out knowledge, and that's our form of research. And then social behavior is what social aspects happen through product use, and these might include things like changing family dynamics, encouraging people to be more active, et cetera. And I have two areas of research. The first is novel use and direction of attention using visual and auditory displays, and social robots and embodied agents. So here's my toilet slide. Um, design in its most simple definition is the human influence on artifacts, environments, and services in the world. And design matters in terms of product function. Some time ago, in the book, The Design of Everyday Things, Don Norman told us that water controls are notoriously poorly designed. And these are two examples from, actually, the Pittsburgh airport. And on the left, you can see that the control was hard to understand, and someone annotated it by hand-drawing the word flush and drawing an arrow to the button. And on the right-hand side, when I went back, the airport had added a sign or a cognitive band-aid indicating how to flush the toilet. So design is really important in terms of product function. But design also matters in the aesthetic, social, and emotional role that it plays in people's lives. And this image is from research I did for Ford about gated communities. And these communities are growing in numbers in the US, and they're very prestigious. It's very popular to own a golf court, cart and to tool around going to Taco Bell and running errands, and people would rather do this in a golf cart than, say, a sports car. And in our observational research, we found this woman driving a golf cart on a major highway, and she was holding her baby on her lap, and she had her toddler strapped in with a clothing belt because golf carts don't have safety features like seat belts. So this image neatly captures how this woman would risk the safety she would mute the function of her products in order to advance the symbolic aspects, the fact that she had this prestigious golf cart in the gated community. So from these examples, we can see that design matters beyond product function. It matters because we can consider wicked problems at a systemic level, a holistic step level, and it allows us to understand the current state 
and suggest an improved future state in the design of a product or prototype. Additionally, we can then study how these things situate in people's lives socially and culturally. Design also matters in the application of technology because it suggests that we have to develop technology with human needs in mind and that we need to ethically consider what we're building. And this is one of the ways that design plays a role in HCI. So for example, in work with General Motors, we used an interdisciplinary user-centered design process to develop the MOVE system, which stands for Maps Optimized for the Vehicular Environment. And this is an abstract dynamic in-car navigation system that works within the limits of the driver's attention to present information only when they can safely take it in. And it relies on principles like abstraction, shown in the example of the London Underground map on the upper left, and simplification, shown in the hand-drawn map on the upper right, to make this system. And we showed um, through study that it resulted in a safer system because people looked at the navigation display uh, one-third as many times, and the duration of their glance was one-sixth as long as it usually is with a full context system. So this is a movie showing how the move system works. And you can see that as the car, which is represented by the yellow triangle, traverses a road segment and it comes to an area of importance, more information is revealed. And so when we come to a cross street or an intersection or we need to know the length of the road we're traversing, we receive that information. So one other thing about design and technology is that the field of HCI is experiencing an increased interest in design research. And one of the reasons is that HCI is broadening. It's moving from the office and the usability perspective that it had for many decades into contexts where people live, play, and work. And as a result, problems are becoming more complex, and we're seeing new areas in design, such as design and emotion, the aesthetics of interaction, ludic design, social interaction, and others. And HCI is moving beyond usability to consider technology products as part of the human experience. So there have been several design research approaches that have been identified both in design and HCI and that have benefited the HCI community. So I want to touch on each of these. The first kind of design research is the research that we most commonly think of, early project research. This is where we conduct upfront research as a member of a design practice team. This is any design activity that's in support of design practice. So when people are designing cars, mobile phones, flip-flops, they're going to pull these resources in. This has also been called clinical research by Dick Buchanan or research-oriented design by Daniel Fallman. And while this is most common in HCI product development, it's probably the most incongruous with HCI research. A second type of design research is pattern seeking. This is where researchers conduct research to understand the patterns within the design process and the artifacts that result. And so you can think of the early work as Chris, of Christopher Alexander as an example. And this has been extended in the HCI community in, in many ways. For example, in Jack Carroll's work, the work of Tom Erickson, Rama Kari, and others. Hey, Jody. Yes. Go back to your, the, the observation slide, one, one previous. What, what is it about this strategy that strikes you as incongruous? HCI research, because I feel like, at least in the last 15, you know, maybe in the 70s that was true, but in the last 15 years it seems relatively common to start out by poking around. Yes, but it would be my hope that then knowledge that was gained would be generalized and might come into a research effort of its own. So in this kind of research I'm talking about, uh, a consultancy might research about toothbrushes and nothing they've learned maybe carries on. It's the most simple form of design research, I guess. I, so not you that think, it's... You think this doesn't, is not what gets published in CHI? It's not what gets published in CHI. It's not what makes design research really exciting for design researchers. Yeah. A third type of research in design is critical research. And this is almost an artistic stance. This is where designers make artifacts and place them in the world to suggest a stance or framing and to get a certain response. And this work is interesting because it suggests a future state in response to a current state. 
And many of these artifacts often involve future technology. So you can think of the work of Bill Gaver, Tony Dunn, and Fiona Raby, um, who made these very critical artifacts. For example, this is a picture of Gaver's drift table. This was a table that didn't really have any specific functionality. You would place heavy objects on the top, and it would uh, redirect a map of the area underneath. And you could then look into the portal and see what part of the map was brought up. So this was a framing about ludic design that, that some people didn't know how to use technology or didn't really care or didn't want to care. And what could we do in this way with technology? Another type of design research that has seeped into the HCI community is research on design. And this is research about design to understand its values, methods, and approaches. And we see this taking place in the design community since the beginning of time, but more recently in the HCI community and the work of Nigel Cross, Harold Nelson, and Eric Stolderman, and Jack Carroll. And then finally, research through design, which we find to be a new and fruitful area and really an area that we've been able to bring design research successfully to HCI. And this is where we use methods from design practice to explore wicked or multidimensional problems. We understand the current situation, and then we suggest a future state in the form of a designed artifact. And this has been good because it complements approaches that are in HCI research, and it allows design research to stand on an equal footing with other kinds of research in HCI. So some research such as Ilpo Koskinen's proactive technology study, or my colleague John Zimmerman's studies on families, this is a, called a reverse alarm clock in the image, suggest how we might improve a future state through a new product. So when I came to the HCI, I saw that we needed new design research approaches. And we needed to teach HCI practitioners that design research has its own rigor. And that design research could indeed be an intellectual tradition that was on an equal footing. So whereas when I first came to the School of Computer Science, people asked me to make things pretty and bring the bottom up. I saw that there was a much greater need to integrate design research within HCI. And so in today's talk, I'm going to talk about two big insights that I've learned in bringing design research to HCI. And they were gained in my time collaborating with computer scientists, social psychologists, cognitive psychologists, roboticists, and others. And the first is that design allows us to systematically investigate failure. That is, it reduces a team's risk of making the wrong thing. And the second is that design allows us an intentional way for fostering social and cultural change through the artifacts that we develop and put forward in the world and study the effect of afterwards. And I'm going to use some examples from my research to try to show how design research can blend with activities in HCI. So to set the context for my talk, I'm going to talk about some technology development that happened at Carnegie Mellon almost 10 years ago. And by subsequently joining this effort and bringing design to technology, we were able to make the right thing and greatly extend the impact of this research. So in 2000, Carnegie Mellon became interested in how robotic technology could help the older population. And this was for a number of reasons. As you know, already this population is growing, and we don't have enough caregivers or care facilities to take care of them. Also, in terms of actually building technology, we have a lot to understand about how these technologies will best situate in people's homes. And then finally, Carnegie Mellon, with its Robotics Institute and its Human Computer Interaction Institute, was poised to deploy and study these robots in a number of settings. And this picture shows one of the first social robots that was developed at CMU. Um, the project was called the NurseBot Project, and this is Pearl, and she's interacting with residents at a local community. So you can see that this was a very visionary project, but it was a technology-driven vision. And with it came some pros and cons. Some of the benefits were technology development. It drove new algorithms for navigation, for instance. It interested technologists and the elderly as a user group. And it forced them to evaluate the outcomes of what they designed. But there were some cons, too. Because the robot was not co considered holistically or systematically, there was a lot of problems. The technology was expensive and fragile. It constantly broke down. We were constantly fixing it. And there was a little view of the role of context in human needs. 
So as design researchers, we got involved for two reasons. One was to bring a better understanding of the people and the context where the robot would be used. And the second was to control the robot, to uh, design the robot systematically. So our initial work on Pearl, we first fixed the head. It was cracked. And instead of having one face, we designed a system of different facial configurations that could modify the robot's appearance. This work led to a five-year NSF grant bringing the discipline of design to HCI and robotics. And our research group, the Project on People and Robots, continued to be very successful in doing this work. We created a new conference, the Human-Robot Interaction Conference. We trained new kinds of graduate students that use design skills in their um, doctoral work. And we fostered collaborations with the local community, but also other researchers internationally. So today our group's going strong, and we have members from design, computer science, robotics, social science, cognitive science, and others. And our overarching research goals include understanding how people and robots will interact with one another in the social world, aiding robotic technology development towards effective human-robot interaction, and advancing the dialogue on the appropriate and useful deployment of robots in work and domestic settings. So in these efforts, we assure that we're designing the right kinds of systems that can benefit people and, and foster social change. So in our design research group, we do a number of studies. For example, we do design studies and ethnographic studies. So returning to the topic of elders, we did a longitudinal study of product use. We studied how elders and their caregivers use products and how this changes as people decline physically and cognitively. We identified over 52 opportunities for how technology could help this population, and we grouped these into five groups. Health and wellness, which included medicine management, social and emotional support, leaving a legacy, which is an idea of what happens when somebody goes to a nursing home or passes away and their partner remains. The favorite place, which is the idea that as we could decline, we spend more and more time in one chair in the house, and controlling the environment. And more recently, we've done some studies on service design and system design. Our lab studies look at what design features, for example, gaze, speech and sound, gesture, and proximity to the user can drastically affect how people interpret a robot's design and behavior, and for example, how they anthropomorphize or make lifelike attributions to a technology. And then finally, we've done field trials to understand the context where a robot might be used, both before and after it's introduced. And we did that with Pearl, Roomba, and some other robots. So in order to create a system that we could feasibly study long term, we returned to the idea of developing a robot that could interact with our wireless infrastructure. So we could study HRI long term right on our university campus. So in 2007, we began working on the Snackbot project. And this time, we d decided that we would start from the bottom and develop the robot holistically, with design researchers involved at the start. And so what you see in this slide is a direct comparison of Pearl on the left and Snackbot on the right. So the Snackbot is a robot that delivers snacks in our buildings. It provides a useful continuing service to the <laughs> university community. And it provides an opportunity to study long-term human-robot interaction. And this time, we approached the design of the robot with a holistic design framing. And we had three design goals for the development of the robot. The first was to develop the robot holistically. So rather than advancing technology per se or focusing on one aspect, such as navigation or dialogue, we looked at the robot at a system context level. And this allowed us to understand the emergent qualities of developing the robot holistically rather than if it had been done piece by piece. The second goal was to simultaneously develop a robotic product and service. And so by this, we meant that the robot would need to be more than sociable and attractive. It would need to deliver something useful to people. And we adopted this goal to increase the likelihood that people would want to engage with the robot over time. We developed the snack delivery service that would collect behavior uh, information about the people that use the service so we could continue to modify and improve the robot's design over time. And then the third goal was to develop interaction designs that would help to evoke social behavior. 
And because the robot would be used as a research platform to study people over time, all of the decisions about functions and features had to be made in, in, with the goal of promoting sociability. So for example, we aim to have the robot interact with people using a natural dialogue because research shows that people will talk to a robot longer when it can actually speak. So other aspects of sociability that we're include, uh, exploring include politeness, personalization, nonverbal behavior, appearance, and others. So the result of about three years of design and engineering um, is SnackBot that you see here, a four and a half foot tall robot that carries a tray of cookies and apples. It travels on wheels at about one to two miles per hour. It can navigate the office building autonomously and it can rotate completely in space. The robot emits speech and sounds. It has an LED mouth and a directional microphone that feeds into a Sphinx 4 speech recognition system and it's been featured on the PBS show Science Trek and introduced to Bill Gates. <laughs> what snack did he take? Uh, he didn't take any snack. <laughs> <laughs> He's not very interactive that way. Um, he, wanted pizza. he wanted pizza, yes. So we've done a great deal of iterative work to support our design goals, and we continue to revisit those holistically in support of imagining and creating a future state. And these studies have brought design thinking to other disciplines as we apply different design methods to the development of the robot and service. And so a result of bringing design to this robot has been an advance in the field of HRI and more recently some advances in service design. And this diagram shows how the design activities interweave with the technology development rather than just coming at the beginning or the end. So some of our new research and design efforts uh, include studies on service design, ethnographic studies of robots in organizations, how robots should communicate intentions and errors, how we should define and design interaction for collaboration with people, and how robots should communicate. And I'm going to talk about a few of those today. And first I want to talk about service design, because we framed a lot of the interaction around SnackBot as a service design ex um, effort. And service design really grows from this intersection of design and business. But in my view, um, service design is still disconnected from the rich user-centered research methods that are often employed in HCI. So we started to conceive of the robots um, snack delivery as a service platform, and we've seen some impact so far. One of the impacts is that we've begun to advance the research and service design. There's not a lot of studies of technology and service in the literature especially for people um, who interact with technology in groups. Most of these studies take the form of this person used an ATM or this person used a website. So looking at groups of people interacting with technology services is new. The second is that we can connect all of the shareholders in a service design, not just the customer and the service provider. So if you think of the example of public transportation, of course you could think about the person who rides transportation and the company as two of the people in the service paradigm. But there are lots others. For example, drivers who benefit from decreased traffic on the road are also indirectly customers in this service design. So using this framing, we can begin to extend the impact of a service design. So it might be useful to briefly define what service design is. Services are different than products because they have tangible and intangible aspects. So for example, all of us have stayed in a hotel and there's many tangible aspects to the service. There's the decor of the rooms, the funny chairs in the lobby that look kind of scary and uncomfortable. There's the robes and the soaps, but there's also intangible aspects. There's room service. There's how people treat you when you call down to the desk. But what results is this intangible experience collectively of what it means to stay in the hotel. Another difference between service design and product design is that services rely on co-creation. They require the existence of a customer in order for them to exist. Another difference is that services are produced at the time they're consumed. And this is different from products which keep getting manufactured no matter what. So we've begun to apply user-centered design to service work defining user interaction in this space with the robot as a service design problem. And it's good to apply design methods here because we can describe methods, we can cover a design space, and we can look at many candidate des designs before we decide what to build. And from this work, 
um, some of the methods and robots which you see in the slide, we're hoping to develop some building blocks of service and some generalizable outcomes about adaptive service design with technology systems. So in our current um, HRI research with SnackBot, we're conceiving of a service design that adapts to people's changing behavior and preferences. And we asked, what if one of the components in the service design was a robot? And what if the service could adapt based on user behavior patterns and express preferences? And these questions are really important in industry too, I think. So for example, one of the local newspapers in Pittsburgh is considering a four fee content delivery service. Well, as you know, you can get probably any newspaper online for free now. So this is a context where we really would have to understand what the customer would want and would pay for. So service designs are traditionally communicated in the form of a service blueprint. And this is a process diagram that was created in the 1980s and has remained relatively unchanged since. A service blueprint is a plan, usually in terms of a flow model, that orchestrates all the compo components in a service design. But service blueprints don't really predict how customers and services might change over time. And this is something that we coined the phrase adaptive service design for. So we modified the service blueprint to account for this. And we added four phases in the service design. Orientation, which is where people use a service for the first time. Incorporation, which is where they adopt the service regularly. Streamlining, which is where some of the service might be simplified because people are familiar with it. And then personalization, which is where people make meaning with service. And I'll talk about each of these in turn, but there's a couple important outcomes from this work. And one is the exploration of cultural models that allow us to understand how to best design a particular service based on people's response. And then a second outcome is that we've developed this new class called Adaptive Service Design to capture and study this phenomenon. So orientation describes the first time a person interacts with a service. And this is where people make sense. Sense making happens here. And people will rely on things they're familiar with. In SnackBot's case, a human snack deliverer, which we did observe as we designed the robot, to make sense of the service. So in a service example, we know that we need to really support and rely on two-way interaction between the users and the service. So we did, in fact, rely on some of those social cues that we saw snack vendors use in the interaction design for SnackBot. And we became uh, soon aware that we needed to respond to breakdowns in the environment. So having multiple sensors on the robot so that if one sensor stream breaks down, we can still respond appropriately, even if it's just to say that the robot's thinking and needs more time. Incorporation is where people use services daily and build trust and attachment with them. And for service design, we're relying on this idea of cultural models to exist in incorporation of services in, into people's lives. And these are basically frames for how people experience technology. There's three of them, relational, utilitarian, and oppositional. So the relational model is a positive, positively emotional frame. People look at technology as social. They want to have a positive outcome from it. They want to have reciprocity. So for SnackBot, we might build on conversation that the robot has with a customer. Or we might bring a free gift on a special day. A utilitarian model is not emotional. This is where people want to maximize the value they get from a service for the time spent interacting with it. People might trust the service less, so we might need to design accordingly to mediate that. And then finally, we have an oppositional model, which is a negatively emotional model. And this is where people become upset because they feel like they don't have control. So I'm sure you're sitting and thinking about um, example services that you interact with where maybe you feel social or you feel like you don't have any control. An interesting idea is that cultural models can be predicted. So we have a roboceptionist robot in our lobby. And we gathered data from that robot. And we found that something even as simple as a social greeting, whether or not, or not someone says hello to the uh, robot, can predict accurately about 85% of the time whether they're evoking a re relational model or not. So streamlining happens after the service has been used many times. And this is where certain touch points in the service might be streamlined or speeded up. 
And for SnackBot, we're thinking about combining or automating some portion of the service journey. So I had said a few minutes earlier that we aim to have the robot interact with people using natural uh, language. Here's a place where auditory information might be more interruptive. And once people are comfortable with the robot, they could rely on an auditory icon or ear con, which is an abstract sound, which is less interruptive and easy to learn and remember. We also might automate some of the portions of a regular delivery service. So we might have people confirm orders just once a week instead of every day. Or the robot might just show up with a cookie on Friday if it knows that those are your learned habits. And then personalization is where we have opportunities to create meaning with the service. And here is where we really want to respond to human priorities and values. So here in terms of SnackBot, the robot can make recommendations. We're looking at some behavioral economic strategies to um, inspire healthy snacking. And we can really look at the meaning of snacking in our workplace. So in our computer science building, snacks represent a social break, but they also represent people working hard because people will work all night. There's no places open to get meals, and so snacks become meals. So we can look at combining with other services to maximize these kinds of values that people see in snacking within the context of our building. So I think the combination of service design and user-centered methods are really important. And I wanted to just talk briefly about this study we did at McGee Hospital, where we conducted a 15-month-long ethnographic study of an autonomous delivery robot, the Atheon Tug, in a local hospital. And we did observations, interviews, and site um, research in two places within the hospital. And what we learned was that different members of the same organization can interact with robots very differently based on their role in the organization and the type of work that we do. they do. So as I said, we studied two units in the hospital, a postpartum ward where people were joyous, lots of visitors, new babies, not many emergencies, and then a cancer ward where the work is very time critical and very serious, and often very grim. These units have the same architectural layout, and the robot was programmed to do the same things within each unit, to deliver cafeteria trays and collect linen that was loaded by staff. However, people responded quite differently in these two wings, and how work was conducted, the social relationships that formed around the robot, and even the physical environment, how it was used and adapted, was very different. And staff responded very differently to the changes brought about by bringing this robot into the work environment. So our grounded theory suggested that an interpretation of a new technology like a robot could drastically differ within the same organization. So in the cancer ward, people had very low tolerance for interruptibility. They cursed at the robot, they kicked it, they pushed it, and they said that they wanted to be left alone. On the other hand, in the postpartum ward, people welcomed the robot, and they decorated it, and they even asked if it could announce itself in the voice of a favorite singer. So, for example, in designing to minimize interruptions, we would need to make sure that the personal care, which was so important in the cancer ward, could be supported, but that other social relationships, like in the postpartum ward, could also be supported. So, for example, in the cancer ward, the robot might interrupt with an ambient signal and simply be in standby till someone could attend to it. Whereas in the postpartum ward, yes, maybe it could sing in a favorite singer's voice. And based on this work, we now know that simple modifications to the interaction design might really support better how the robot would be adopted into an organization. So our vision of service robots is that they'll interact fluidly with people. But the reality is, I can sadly tell you, that we're a long way away, and robots still fail often. So one of a, the other research areas that I'm really interested in is how to communicate intentions and errors. And this, I think, is also a good place to apply design research, because we can quickly cover the design space, test a lot of different uh, potential designs, and figure out what to build, rather than building expensive technology first. So I'm going to show you this video of a robot making an error. This is a robot with a wham arm, and it's delivering a drink to a bin in the front of the frame that we can't see, and it fails. And in watching this movie, um, 
I want you to look at and listen to how committed people are to the robot's success. Oops. Oh. 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 oh, robots make mistakes. <laughs> so our current research is exploring different strategies to mitigate the effects of these and many other kinds of breakdowns. And um, we tested some of these mitigation strategies in an online study, and we compared these two robots, Snackbot, which I already introduced you to, and Herb, which is a robot developed uh, collectively between Carnegie Mellon and Intel. It has a Segway base. In this picture, it has one wham arm, but we've added another one. So it's going to have two arms. And in our study, we use perception, which is a common problem in many robotic systems. So some of our research questions were, can we use a strategy that works even before a robot makes a mistake? So for example, the robot might warn a customer, this is a really hard task for me, and I might not be able to do it. And then when the robot has to recover from its mistake, what recovery strategies will work best? And third, based on our cultural models idea, should recovery strategies differ based on the customer? So as I said, we conducted an online scenario study. And the scenario was the following. Chris was a person who recently had knee surgery and needed some help. And in the scenario, Chris is thirsty and asks the robot to bring a can of Coke. And the robot says, OK. The robot looks at Coke and Sprite on the counter. And after a few minutes, it returns with the Sprite, the wrong drink. And Chris says, OK, good, but I wanted a Coke. And then we had the robot's response differing based on a couple different conditions. In the first condition, it didn't apologize at all. In the second um, condition, based on the reciprocal cultural model, the robot apologized. An apology conveys politeness, courtesy, concern, and empathy. And it's a simple enough thing to do. So we wondered if it would work with a robot. In the next condition, based on the utilitarian model, the robot offered to drink for free. And we thought that this would maximize the value people might perceive in the service and perceive, help the service to be perceived more fairly. And then finally, in the last condition, um, the robot offered to go back and get a Coke. And this was based on the oppositional model, which might allow people to feel more control if they could actually have the drink that they wanted. So now in half the conditions, we also used expectancy setting strategy. Before people viewed the scenario, the robot told them that the task was hard and they might make a mistake. So to test these ideas, we conducted an online scenario study. It was a two by four experiment, which you see here. We also had a control condition where there was no breakdown. The Coke came. We had a 30 second video of each robot. And we explained, we had people watch these, and we explained that the robot is autonomous and makes decisions on its own. And then they viewed Snackbot or Herb in these four conditions. Before viewing the, video, uh, the scenarios, we did a survey that ascertained people's cultural models and orientations to service. And then after they viewed the scenario, they filled out another survey, which um, had them evaluate the perceptions of the robot how much they liked it, trusted it, or felt like it, their evaluations of the service, and how likely they thought it was that Chris would use the service again. So surprisingly, these effects of these strategies didn't differ depending on the type of the robot. And it's really interesting because Herb, in its current incarnation, does not look humanoid at all. Um, <coughs> Apology worked a little bit better than with Snackbot than with Herb, but the difference wasn't statistically significant. And this might be because after viewing the videos and interacting with the scenarios, people really thought that the robots were equally, equally human-like. When they just saw the video, they rated Snackbot as being more human-like than Herb, but this difference seemed to disappear after they saw both of the robots speaking. So this idea that natural language is a really humanistic design feature seems to be true. And it seems also that maybe very simple design features might make a robot seem human-like. So
So I'll talk a little bit about the effects of our strategies, forewarning and the different kinds of apology. So first, the effect of forewarning, telling the user in, in advance that the task is hard and the robot might make a mistake. So forewarning significantly improved participants' judgment about the service, but it didn't increase their willingness to use the service again. Forewarning also significantly increased the evaluation of the robot across all measures. When the robot warned in advance, people trusted it more, they liked it more, and they felt more that the robot was closer to them. And now we'll look at the effects of the three recovery strategies, apology, compensation, and providing options. So in terms of apology, it did not increase people's judgment of the service. They didn't like the service any better when the robot apology, apologized, but increased their willingness to use the service again significantly. And it marginally improved the evaluation of the service across all measures, but it didn't have any interaction effect with how people perceive the robot. In terms of compensation, offering to bring a drink for free to uh, maximize the value spent with the service, this significantly increased the people's judgment of the service, but it only marginally increased their willingness to use the service again. And it significantly Im improved their evaluation of the service across all measures. And then finally, the effect of options, going back to get, a free drink, uh, get the right drink and to make people feel like they have more control. This was significantly effective in increasing the willingness to use the service again, but it didn't really improve their evaluation of the service. So forewarning and apologies were more effective than providing a free drink or other options. And people rated the robot most competently when it merely apologized, when it didn't try to do anything else. So these two um, design studies, the Atheon Tug and the Scenario Study, I think provide some pretty compelling inter um, evidence for interface design and interaction design because they suggest that one robot working within an organization or a group will need to have several modalities to operate seamlessly. And we also know now, too, that if we can predict even simple things about a user's behavior, we can better design services and interfaces so people will use robots over time. So one of the design implications might be we should use different strategies depending on service characteristics. We might use a compensation if a robot breaks down during a one-time service, such as this bartending robot, or it might use an apology where people are interacting with the service repeatedly, for example, in a care robot. The second implication is that we could tailor recovery strategies to people's service orientations. So one way that we might do this, obviously, is to use greeting to infer somebody's orientation to technology. And if people greet a robot, then the robot might be more social, it might chat more, it might be more polite, it might engage in small talk, it might say thank you more frequently. So today I've tried to talk about how design brings insights to the development of new products and how it tells us how to make the right thing, and how design research, and our research in particular, can produce knowledge that has enriched the field of design. So in the future, we can expect that design will continue to grow in importance, and hopefully to interact with other disciplines on an equal footing. As a result, designers will need to develop new synthetic and integrative approaches that blend the approaches of design with the approaches of other disciplines. And as a response, I think, educators will need to train new students and professionals in these methods. But at the end of the day, I think design will continue to do what it does now, which is to rely on timely, local, particular, bottom-up knowledge. So in conclusion, I've tried to illustrate this need for design and design research approaches with other disciplines. I've tried to show how we can benefit from systematically investigating failure and creating social change through what we design and build. And I've tried to describe design and design research as their own intellectual disciplines within the context of other disciplines. And it's my hope as a design researcher within HCI that we can continue to extend the boundaries of design and design research and to create a larger cultural understanding of design. So thank you very much for listening.
Any questions? Scott? How would we figure out, in your view, whether something, whether a project is a research project or a development project? What would be the, the correct decision criteria? Well, I think um, Daniel Fallman has a really nice model, the triangular model. So I'll just explain it for people that don't know. Daniel is in the context of a university where they get a lot of corporate funding to do research. So they get a lot of money from Volvo, for example. And he has developed this model where um, working for clients can be a basis of one form of exploration. We might be working with a technology or a medium. And then those could move out to design explorations, which is a certain kind of design research, and then upward to design theory. So I think there's room for everything. I think that designers have to be in control and be able to draw out knowledge from what they design. So there's lots of designers who work very implicitly and they make beautiful things, but they are not well able to talk about how this extends what's being done in the field. And so I think that's a particular part of it too. So probably creating a space to have a discourse about it, which is a two-headed beast in academia right now because we have the oral literacy of a critique and then we have conference publications, which aren't always suited to design. So I think we have a little bit of a problem still. So it sounds like you're saying the main criteria that makes something research is the ability to articulate the principles that that design manifests or implements or what we learned in that. Yes, I think there's a couple things. Um, there's rigor, that there was rigor in the design process, that there was a documentation of what people did and what made critical shifts in what happened. Um, there's this idea of extensibility, that we could not replicate the work if we did the methods again, but use them again. Um, and that what we make is relevant, that there's some framing that makes it the right thing. And that doesn't mean that design failures are not important. I, th I think those are important, too. Yes. Um, yeah, so um, I love your little taxonomy of, um, of things to say when there's breakdown. Um, and uh, it uh, reminds me, Will Wright did a bunch of uh, videos of robots doing breakdown in, 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 um, in restaurants. You've got to get your hands on them. And, and also, this, guy, this broken robot next to the dumpster asking for help. This player is watching these videos. And I guess, you know, so I think, well, maybe the, the, the when I need assistance would be another little taxonomy like the one you have. Um, how many do you think there would be? You know, there would be a use, there would be useful conversational um, uh, things like your apology. You know, well, so we could have robot-centered strategies, but I think they would be reductive. So here's a simple example. Um, building code declares that every building, every door in every building should be able to be opened automatically for people who can't push a door open for whatever reason. Yet, in many buildings, it's not like that. So in the case of navigation, if architectural constraints could be sure that doors were opening automatically, robots wouldn't have breakdowns at doorways. So I think while the taxonomy is one good approach, we need to also holistically look at the robot plus the context of work. So I guess I'm saying in a long way, I don't really know the answer to your question, and that there's probably more to think about than the robot's view of New York. You know, there's the, the world view of New York, for example. Yeah. Yes. I was going to ask you a question about the cultural models in the study, in the breakdown study. Do you look at all at the demographics or the, the individual um, characteristics, evidence of cultural models in the individual's mindset that affect their interaction with the different types of mediations that you Well, so this was a survey, so we don't really know who we had. and. We tried to ascertain what people's cultural models were by asking, we had a set of questions that we asked them beforehand, and they were centered on scenarios like, in a restaurant, I like to get this kind of service. And then based on their responses to these questions, we could calculate which cultural model we thought that they um, held up. So yes, there's a lot of limitations to that approach, but it's a first stab at the space. There's another problem with doing this kind of research with real robots in that, A, 
robots have to act the same way again and again, and often they don't. And B, if things fail repeatedly, what does that mean? So, you know, if every time I use united.com it breaks down, I am going to change my behavior. You know, and it's not going to be in a way that I want to see how I'm responding to united.com. So there's a lot of problems with really trying to do this research. So I don't know if that answers your question. Was there any correlations with the, the pre-survey you did and um, I'm not sure what you mean by that. Well, did you find any, anything interesting in that data that you collected? Uh, it's very murky data. <laughs> so we know clearly that apology is helpful, but I think we need to know more. So, yeah. Yes? You mentioned at the start about uh, design research generalizing, and with that in mind, I'm curious, did you look at um, where you use two different kinds of robots? Did you look at if you used a human to carry out the same tasks and to act in the same manner, um, would we have expected the same kind of results? We're doing that right now, actually. So I can't really tell you because we're just collecting the data. But we also did, uh, we did a delivery study in the office with both the robot and the human, and we're looking at that data too. Yes, I think that needs to be done, obviously. Good, good point. Terry, did you have a question? Please, I paint your picture here. You mentioned in one of your earlier slides, gaze. Does it try to use some of the basic It uses uh, crude head movements. Um, this robot's eyes are cameras, so they can't really move expressively. But we were able to uh, make a simple palette of movement gestures. And you can put those together, and they flow in a pretty natural way. So the robot looks up and down, side to side, 45 degree angles. Yeah, so it's really pretty impressive. You can use simple features and put together, they look fairly believable. So um, that's the best we can do right now. It was a lot harder building this robot than anybody thought, so. <laughs> yes? Why did you kind of empty more fake instead of like do more fake designs? Well, we tested all along the appearance of the robot. I didn't have time to talk about that today, but we worked with many, many, many quarter scale, half scale, and full scale models. And we put them out in the world and have people respond to them. And we settled on this height and this form for the robot because we felt like it needed to be suitable for our university setting. It needed to feel like a peer rather than something that was greater than or lesser than the people that it worked with. And we wanted to have a kind of childlike appearance. We wanted it to look friendly and approachable. So these are some of the reasons why the robot appears as it does now. Also, in using a semi-humanoid form like this, it's very easy to design because the forms are simple. So I didn't really get a chance to talk about it, but we had the form built out of fiberglass at a custom car manufacturer because of cost and durability. And so there are some limitations in this fabrication process. So all of these things come together in making de decisions about how, how something's going to appear. And so there's a long history of how the reasons why we did these things. And we have a paper about the design process if you want to look at it. I can certainly share it with you. Yes? How does one decide? In, in, the, in the process of making decisions for a robot, how does one decide that a certain design requires a study to be done? Like, you could have done a study on the size of the head mm -hmm. or the color of the body. Well, you chose, so that's you a, chose good, a good yeah. area, but I mean, how do you know when a decision a should question. just be made versus uniform study? Well, we did do some studies on those things that you suggested, but I think the important thing to say about that question is the designer's intuition is always going to play a role in how they make a decision. So we can bring all the empirical data in the world to the table, but at the end, we make a judgment about what we feel is right. And that is a way that design is different and makes people very nervous to talk about it as a research activity. Because it means that if A and B and C all did the same methodology, we would come out with different things simply because of our own biases that we bring to the problems. So yes, we did study, we did color studies, and we did form studies, and we did, we have a whole paper about robot faces, but at the end of the day, we also made some judgments about it. 
And those may or may not be the right things. But that is the way that it is. So I think that's a really good question. They're basically just autistic decisions? They're decisions based on what we know about the domain, you know, our implicit feeling about the texture and the materials. It's what uh, Schoen called the reflective conversation with the material. It's, yeah, it's a very intuitive thing. Useful just label it up to make a decision, then this is out of your brain. Yes. Because yes. the argument is not engineering. Exactly. It's an artistic decision. Exactly. Mm -hmm. I want to use my mention of Roomba. What do you find that interesting in the studies of Roomba? Yes, very many things. Um, basically, we studied adults, older adults, and regular adults in homes, and we observed how people cleaned for about a month. And then after that period of time, we gave them either a Roomba or a handheld stick vacuum that had basically the same suction functionality, but you have to push it. And people could keep those vacuums, and we went back for a year to study how people cleaned. And we found in the households with Roombas, there were drastic changes in how people cleaned, who cleaned, how often they cleaned, and what kind of cleaning they did. So. There's basically two types of cleaning, for those of you who care. There's opportunistic cleaning, which is cleaning up as you go. That would be like making your bed in the morning or wiping out the microwave after you use it. And then there's planned cleaning, which is when things fall below an a acceptable state and chemicals come out and rags. So with the Roomba, there was much more opportunistic cleaning because people didn't have to do anything but turn the robot on. And then as a result, the acceptable state of the house stayed where it was at longer. So people did more opportunistic cleaning, but also, um, probably because of the gadget effect, more people in the household cleaned. So we saw men cleaning and teenagers cleaning, and you know, they don't usually clean. So that's a big step for cleaning, I guess. <laughs> and Dyson vacuums are supposed to be really popular, too, although I didn't study those. I I think cleaning is fascinating, but there's not a lot of overlap between cleaning and HCI yet, so maybe we should design some new things. Okay, thank you. For more, please visit us at stanford.edu.